This happened on June 7, 2013, when I was a freshman in college. It was a regular day where I had three classes. I finished one class and had an hour between one class and the beginning of another. I always went to our campus library. But on my way to the library, I received a call from my brother. He told me that he saw a man shooting at a bus in the middle of the street. I expressed to him how crazy I thought that was. He also told me that the car sped away. He doesn't know where they went. I got to the library and I told him that I would call him back. As I was sitting in the library with my head in a book, I happened to see a random car park in the middle of our campus and two people got out. One man and one woman. The woman was running frantically and the man got out wearing all black with what looks like a rifle in his hand. I then thought back to what my brother just told me, thinking that this might be the same person. At the same time, I thought to myself, why is this police officer getting out of that random car? He was dressed just like a SWAT officer, sort of. I sat there trying to figure out what was going on as this man walked across the courtyard. Then all of a sudden, he walked up to this woman, who I knew from one of my classes, and without hesitation, he shot her and continued to walk toward our building. I began to yell out to everyone that he has a gun, and I was pointing outside. I saw a few people react when I did, due to the sound of the gunshot. They began to yell also. It all happened so fast and a lot of us began to hide because we couldn't get out. Some people got out, but we didn't have time to. I hid in an aisle. I saw the man enter through the automatic doors with his rifle to his side. He was yelling out that he was a police officer, but he didn't hold his weapon like one. But once he said that a few students came out from hiding, he grabbed his weapon and they ran, but he didn't shoot. I peeked my head out more as the man walked to the front desk. I can see the librarian peek her head around, but she looked confused. The man saw her as he were walking past the desk. He stopped. He looked to where she was, but she just so happened to move away. She actually walked away instead of run for some reason. He walked through the doors into a hallway where she went into. I came out from hiding and placed myself where I could see the hallway all the way down the hallway. He followed the librarian. She went into a closet with other people and the shooter started to bang on the door, but he kept saying that he was the police. He told them to open within a few minutes or he'll shoot, but within a few seconds, he began to fire into the door. I heard people screaming and I wanted to help, but I felt that would be suicide for me being that I didn't have a weapon. I heard people saying that the police are coming. The man stopped shooting and started to bang on the door even more. He then left that door, heading back toward us. I went back into hiding, but could still see. He walked through the room where we were and he went out into the first set of doors and the cops were right there. The cops and the shooter began to fire at the same time and then it all stopped. The cops dragged the man outside and escorted all of us outside. Out there, it was pretty chaotic. Eventually we found out who the shooter was. His name was John Sawari. He went on a shooting spree within our city that day. This happened in 2013 but it still feels like it just happened yesterday. This happened on the day after Christmas in the year 2000. I worked at Edgewater Technology in Wakefield, Massachusetts. The day started off pretty normal. I clocked in and went to my station. We all did. I can remember that the aura of the day was off, but I might just be saying that due to what happened that day. After working for a little bit, I had to run to the bathroom due to my Christmas food from the day before. TMI, I know. I was reading a magazine, using a restroom, and out of nowhere, I heard people yelling and running and saying that he has a gun. Then I heard the rounds go off. It scared the crap out of me, literally. I got up without wiping. Then I heard more shots, but they were closer than before. A few people burst through the bathroom door and they were saying that he's right there. They closed the door and they put the trash can in front of the door while pushing against it. They were also saying that Mike has gone crazy. We heard someone stop right by the door, but he was pleading and then we heard another shot, but he was still making noises. Then another shot 
and then we didn't hear him anymore. But then it got silent. He was right in front of our door. We heard a gun get cocked and someone touching the door handle, but he stopped. There was no more shooting, but we could hear screaming and the fire alarm going off. Everyone in the bathroom was crying and it got worse when the blood was coming in the bathroom from under the door from the person that was laying there. About a minute later, we heard police in the hallway and they were in front of our door, but we were still afraid until we heard them assess the person that was bleeding by our door. They said he was gone. They opened the door and told us it's okay. They got him. The shooter was waiting for the cops in our reception area. His name was Michael Morgan McDermott. He actually worked with us. I don't know why he did what he did, but I can say that it was the worst day of my life. But what I won't forget is the scene once we left the bathroom. So many people were hurt and the looks on the faces of those who got in his way would never leave my memory. What really confuses me is that I saw Michael right before this happened and he was joking around with everyone. This situation really made me not be so quick to trust individuals, no matter how long I've known them. This is the worst day of my life. I was eight years old in the third grade and my younger brother Lucas was in kindergarten. Our school had three different lunch times, kindergarten and first grade, first period, second and third grade, second period, and fourth and fifth grade, third period of lunch. Once the first period of lunch was over, I remember we were doing a weekly assignment. Usually those take about 20 to 40 minutes to finish. 40 minutes later, right as I had finished it, I remember the Dean's voice played on the speaker. He sounded scared and panicked as he said, all students and staff, this is not a drill. Go in a lockdown. I felt worried and started to panic myself, as my somewhat cool and laid back teacher seemed to panic as well and rushed to the door to lock it, close the blinds, and whisper to hide in the blind spot away from the windows. As we all sat in silence for what seemed like hours, we heard a knock on the door. A few girls and boys, including me, all jumped a bit. The slight knocking soon turned into loud banging. A few girls started to panic to only make the already scary situation worse. Minutes felt like hours for him to finally leave. After 15 minutes of hiding in pure terror, the dean finally came over the PA system telling us to walk in the single file line to the entrance of the school to be greeted by police. By the time me and my brother Lucas went into our mom's car, I looked to my brother. He was pale and looked around frantically. When we got home, I asked what was wrong and he said something that still scares me to this day. When that guy was pounding on my brother's classroom door, my brother peeked out from the sink. He saw a tall man looking through the window. He said his teacher literally pushed his head down frantically to hide him so he wouldn't be seen. He mentioned that the door had a window and was barely covered. I also want to say that this was 2013, so I vaguely remember most of the details and had to ask my friend if he remembered the whole incident. I want to show you the layout of the school. The yellow line is where my class is. The red is where my brother's class was. Now we came to the conclusion that he either entered into where the orange line is or the blue line. To give you context on where those lines are located, the orange line leads to the back entrance where there is a fence that is easily able to climb over. The blue line shows a way back between the school grounds and some houses. There's a tiny gate, which is also easy to hop over. Now, I want to clarify that those were assumptions on how he could have entered the school. If he went through the orange line, he must have went to my classroom, then hit a few more classrooms, then went to the kindergarten area, which is where my brother's class was. Or he did vice versa, if he were to enter where the blue line was. Since this was back in 2013, we don't remember if this guy was caught or not. But all I hope is, is that he was caught. My name is Shelly and 10 years ago, I wanted to make my own money because I was tired of asking my parents for money. I put in a lot of applications and I ended up getting hired at Chick-fil-A. 
I'm not going to lie, I was definitely excited because of all of the chicken nuggets I was going to be eating. Anyways, after I got hired, I started to get the hang of the job. It was pretty easy. I worked outside in the drive through line a lot because we were the busiest fast food restaurant in our town, and people really liked my personality. After working there for a few months, my dad's creepy friend Tyler would come there every day at the same time and go to the same drive through line, which was weird because I worked there after school and there were two drive through lines. The drive through line he'd always go to was mine, and he would always call me Shell Shell, which I've hated since I was a small kid. The thing is, he'd always order small stuff like a small fry, or small cookies and cream milkshake. A few times he came into the line, pull up to me, and then he'd say that he forgot his debit card, and he would just try and talk to me. I'm not dumb. I knew exactly what he was doing. Ever since I turned 13, he always acted weird toward me, telling me that I'm growing up into a woman, or that I look like a young woman now. There was this time when my parents were having a get together with family and friends, and I yelled out to my parents that I had to pee, and I ran upstairs. I swear a few seconds later, Tyler burst through the door, looked at me and said, wow, and stared at me. Then he straightened up real quick and said, sorry, my bad, and closed the door. Like I said, he was weird. So we closed at 10 p.m., but we always take orders up until around 9.59. One day, we were inside cleaning up, and it was around 10.30 p.m. There were about five or six of us in Chick-fil-A at the time. I was mopping the floor, and a few of us saw a car pull up to the drive through but turned around at the entrance because we put cones out there after 10 p.m. The car drove around our parking lot at least 10 minutes, and I noticed that it had temporary tags on it. After a while, our manager went outside and went up to the car due to it stopping in front of one of our windows every time it drove around. I watched the manager walk to the car as the driver rolled down the window. The window was all the way down before my manager reached the car. And to my surprise, it was Tyler, my dad's friend. He had a new car that I didn't recognize. But what made this very weird was that even when he rolled the window down, he never looked at my manager. He was staring directly at me talking with my manager. I was standing behind the entrance door. He saw me looking at him, looking at me, but he never turned away like a normal person would. My manager walked back in and told me and my coworkers to hurry up so we can get out of here. I was the last person to get done with my closing, so it was just me and my manager. My manager told me to make sure the doors are locked. I told him okay, then I went to the bathroom. I figured I'll lock them once I'm done. As usual, I was on my phone while using the bathroom, and the bathroom door opens. I thought it was weird because my manager is the only other person in the building, and he's a guy. I yelled out that he's an idiot and he's in the wrong bathroom, but the thing is, he never left. It got weirder because I can hear him breathing by the door, but then I heard, Shell Shell, it's me, Tyler Poo. Are you in here? I picked up my feet so he couldn't see them, but then he started to push open every stall door, saying my name. I texted my boss and it literally said, help, bathroom. Then Tyler got to my stall. He attempted to push the door open and then he laughed. He said that he knows that I'm in there. He looked in the crack of the door and said, there you are. He then got down on his hands and knees, reached his hand under the door and attempted to unlock the stall. I kicked his arm and he said, it's me, Uncle Tyler. As he said that, he proceeded to crawl under my stall door. I started to climb above my stall, then my manager burst through the door as I was screaming and crying. Tyler and my manager began to fight. I called the cops. After a few seconds, Tyler was unconscious on the bathroom floor. When the cops and the EMS got there, he was cuffed and loaded up into the ambulance. He was hit with a few charges and was recently released from jail. That situation just heightened my awareness of my surroundings. Back when I was living on the streets, well technically in my car, I would always post up by fast food restaurants. 
because people would always give me their change or some of the food that they had recently purchased. One day, I posted at the entrance of a plaza, and in that plaza, the busiest place was a Chick-fil-A. Throughout the day, I received a few bucks and a lot of chicken nuggets. After being out there for a few hours, I noticed a car that left a few times and came back to park in the Chick-fil-A parking lot with covered license plates. But the person never got out of the car. Of course, I thought it was weird, but I didn't think anything of it. Throughout the day, I'd take my food to my car and I'd eat. Around 8 p.m., most of the plaza was closing up and the traffic started to slow down. Finally, when Chick-fil-A slowed down for a few minutes, a man in the car got out and he walked up to the door of the restaurant and took a picture of the inside. A few seconds later, what looked like the manager came outside and it looked like she was arguing with the guy. She went back inside and the man got back in his car, got on his phone, and left about five minutes later. FYI, I was parked about 25 feet away from the Chick-fil-A parking lot and could see everything that was going on. So a few hours go by and the place was closed. From the outside, it looked as if the employees were cleaning up. I was trying to fall asleep, then I saw that car from earlier pull up. Then it woke me all the way up. There were two cars left in the parking lot. His car and some other car. And some people left. The only person I saw inside was the woman that he was talking to earlier. I saw the man get out of his car at this point. He was wearing dark colors and with gloves on. And I saw the lights get turned off inside of Chick-fil-A. The man was standing on the side of the building by a dumpster, but in a way where he can't be seen. He was in the shadows. At that point, I leaned my seat all the way back so no one could see me. The woman walked out, turned around, and began to lock the door. As soon as she turned around, that man sprinted toward her, yanked her hair, and started to yell at her as he took her back inside. I leaned up a little bit to get a better look, but I couldn't see anything. There was nothing for about 10 minutes until the man walked back outside. He went straight to his car, but instead of driving away, he drove up to the door and went back in with his trunk left open. A few minutes later, I saw something that I would never forget. The man was dragging the woman's body, but there was no head. He struggled to get her in the trunk, but eventually he got her there. He went back in there and came out with a Chick-fil-A bag full of something and threw it in his trunk. He went back inside again for what seemed like 20 minutes. He came back out, locked up Chick-fil-A, and drove away. Someone else came back for the other car in the parking lot. A few days later, I went into a Starbucks to use the restroom, and on the news was a story about a missing woman. They showed the picture, and it was the woman who worked at Chick-fil-A. They were interviewing her husband, who was crying during the whole interview. What creeped me out is that her husband was the man that I saw with her that fateful night. I know he killed her, but he was on the news as if he didn't have anything to do with it, and like he doesn't know. Seeing that lady that night has haunted me since. It was Halloween of 2012 and I was closing at work, which is Chick-fil-A. We were a new establishment in the area that we're in, and the neighborhood was pretty bad. In and out all afternoon and evening, I saw hundreds of people dressed in their costumes. All of the cliche costumes, Jason, Freddy Krueger, and Michael Myers. At around 7.30, there was a long line inside, and out of nowhere, there was some commotion. My manager came out to break it up. When he broke it up, some guy in the ghost face costume from Scream ran out of the door. That person that ran out of the door got into it with a woman that was dressed as Meg. Meg from Family Guy. At least that's what I thought she was until she told us that she wasn't in costume. She was just ugly. Anyway, this woman told our manager and the cops that some person in the ghost face costume tried to lure her seven-year-old daughter out of the building to his car. The little girl was running back and forth between her mother, who was in line, in the play area inside. I guess the man in the scream costume told the girl that her mom told her to wait in his car and he grabbed her. The mom turned around and saw it, then she started to yell and scream. A few hours later, we locked the doors and then some guy knocked at our drive through window. He had on a ghost face costume from the movie Scream, but I don't know if it was the same guy from earlier. 
I yelled out that we're closed, and this guy tries to bust through the drive through window. I screamed, and the manager ran out, and then that man ran to our front door banging. Then he stopped and just stared at us. At that point, it was just my manager and I. My manager called the cops, and the man left and popped his trunk of his car. He grabbed something out of his trunk and put it under his costume. He then walked back up to the front door. He stared for another 30 seconds and pulled out a gun from under his costume, aimed it and pulled the trigger. We both ducked and screamed, but nothing happened. We looked up and he was fumbling with his gun. He was loading, unloading and reloading. It had jammed. Then the cops showed up with their guns drawn. He got on the ground and they arrested this guy. We found out that this was a dangerous guy and he had a huge rap sheet and we were pretty lucky that nothing happened to us that night. It may be cowardly, but I quit that job soon after that happened because of the neighborhood that, that Chick-fil-A was in. I'm originally from Mexico. For reasons that will become very obvious, I wish to remain anonymous. I used to be involved in the Mexican cartel. I mainly transported drugs across the border into the United States. To make a long story short, I was caught and cooperated with the feds in exchange for immunity and asylum. Before I go any further, you can go ahead and label me a snitch if you want to. I don't care. I personally feel pretty good about writing out a bunch of drug dealing murderers that work for an organization that is responsible for destroying so many of my fellow Mexicans lives. I was forced into this life at a young age. I've always hated the cartel and was already plotting a way to flee Mexico with my mother and two younger sisters. You could say that it was a good thing that I ended up getting caught. The story is not about how I got out of the cartel. It's about the closest call I ever had during my time with the cartel. This happened during the early days. It was the summer of 2005. I remember the date specifically because I had just turned 18 a day prior. Even though I was barely an adult, I was a very intimidating looking guy. I come from a long line of very physically strong men. I've been lifting weights since I was a child. I'm an even-tempered guy and I don't consider myself to be an aggressive person, but I will put somebody through the wall if they piss me off. It was because of my physical presence and my piece of shit father, who was also in the cartel, made me a target for recruitment. When I first started out, myself and two other guys would drive around Mexico City and collect debts and packages from people who owed money to the cartel or one of our distributors. It was on the fourth or fifth run that we ran into some trouble. There was this particular club we frequented where a lot of business was conducted. To make things simple, an exchange would go down in a back room, and we would come shortly after and collect the revenue and drop it off to our capo. So that night, we entered the club and began making our way to the back room. It was a fairly busy night for the club. This DJ from out of town was performing there, so people from all over were there to see him. To get to the back room, we had to go through the main dance floor to the opposite side of the building. There were some renovations that prevented us from using the back entrance. We got out onto the dance floor and started making our way through the crowd. When we were about halfway there, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed directly at me. I quickly ducked, and not a second later, I heard the gun go off. Unfortunately, an innocent girl who was standing beside me caught the bullet. She was shot at point-blank range, and I don't mean to be insensitive when I say this, but the poor girl's head was blasted apart. I remember several things happening simultaneously after the shotgun went off. All of the partygoers immediately fled the club. From my position on the ground, all I saw was a wave of moving legs. When I stood up, I saw a deserted club, my two co-workers with their guns drawn, cursing up a storm, and, unfortunately, the corpse of the young girl who was just shot. I assumed that the shooter got away in the chaos. We quickly busted into the back office to find another bullet-ridding corpse. It was a club owner, who was our contact. 
We immediately fled the scene before the police showed up. I was never informed as to what happened with the club owner and who almost took my head off with a shotgun. I was on the lowest rank of the cartel and they kept us in the dark about a lot of things. I'm grateful that I'm no longer a part of that life. I would like to end things by saying a big fuck you to that asshole who tried to kill me and ended up shooting an innocent girl that night. And to all of those cartel members who got locked up because of me. You got what you deserved. And I'll see you in hell. I'm a 20 year old male and this happened to me in the winter of 2018, the day after Christmas. Me and my parents were on vacation in Maine, visiting my grandmother. As you can probably imagine, being in the state of Maine during the winter, it was freezing. We came up from Texas, so this was definitely not my climate if you know what I mean. My parents had gone out to visit a friend who lived in the area, while me and my grandmother stayed back and watched some movies. My grandmother turned in at about 8 o'clock, and I eventually got bored of watching TV, so I decided to put on my coat and go for a walk outside. My grandmother's neighborhood has this neat stone maze, complete with angel statues and fountains. It was really cool, and something you really don't see a whole lot in neighborhoods these days. My grandmother's neighborhood was one of those 50 plus communities. I doubt you could have something like this in a neighborhood full of kids without it getting defaced with spray painted pictures of penises or something. For me, I actually admired works of architecture like this and was impressed by the amount of effort it must have taken to construct it. It was open from dusk till dawn, however, my grandmother told me that there was no neighborhood security during the holidays and no one would say anything if I wanted to go through the maze after hours, so I did just that. I brought a flashlight with me of course and it took me about 5 minutes to reach the entrance of the maze from my grandmother's place. The maze wasn't massive, but it was big enough that you could get turned around, at least for a little bit. If I could give you guys a somewhat accurate visual of this maze, think of the maze in Resident Evil 4, where Leon had to fight off those dogs and gather puzzle pieces. That's roughly the same size as this maze. When I walked through this maze during the daytime, I would usually listen to my headphones, but something told me not to put them on that night and it's a good thing that I followed my instincts. After I'd say it was about 10 minutes, I suddenly heard the sound of metal scraping against the stone walls. As soon as I heard the sound, alarm bells went off in my head. I froze in place and carefully listened for any other sounds. The scraping noise came again, except this time, there was a deep voice that followed it. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. This sent chills down my spine, realizing that I was now in a maze at night with a possible maniac. The maze had these areas where a statue or a fountain would be. In these locations, there was shrubbery that lined the maze walls. There was just enough space between the wall and the bushes for a small person like me to hide behind. And since I didn't know the best route to exit the maze from where I was, I decided that the best course of action was to hide. I made my way into the area where a statue of David the Archangel was, and I quickly took cover behind the shrubbery that lined the walls. The streetlights located outside of the maze provided enough light for you to see your surroundings. However, it was still dark enough to obscure the details of objects and people. I feel that I needed to point that out, because from my hiding spot, I could see the corridor that I entered from. After about a minute, I watched a dark figure emerge from the shadows and make its way in front of the statue. I remember thinking how awesome it would be if the statue came to life and helped me out of this situation. But that thought quickly faded when the figure made its way directly in front of me. I could now see that it was holding something in its hands. I know that I said that you really couldn't tell any distinguishing features of objects because of the poor lighting. However, it was obvious what the figure was holding, even in the dark. I could make out the distinct shape of a pickaxe. As the figure moved slowly through the area, 
I heard what I can only describe as teeth clattering. This only disturbed me even more, as the dark shadow moved to the other side of the area and disappeared into the opposite corridor. After a few minutes of gathering my wits, I was reasonably sure that if I went back down the way I came, I could backtrack and make my escape. I cautiously moved out from my hiding spot to the corridor. I stopped in my tracks as I heard the sound of metal scraping again. It was coming from the opposite corridor where the figure had vanished. Before I could turn to look, I heard that same deep voice cut through the silence. I see you. I turned my head to see the figure running towards me, pickaxe raised above its head. That's when I took off through the corridor and frantically made my way through the dark maze. There was no time to navigate through the maze properly, so I just had to guess my way through the labyrinth as the lunatic with the pickaxe closed in behind me. After about five minutes of twists and turns, I finally saw the exit. I tore through the snow-covered ground and towards the opening. Just before I crossed the threshold, I heard a loud smash coming from right behind me. I gave a quick glance to see the pickaxe lying in the snow by the entrance. What I think happened was that my pursuer saw that I was about to exit the maze and decided to heave his pickaxe at me, but missed. As soon as I was outside of my grandmother's house, I pulled out my phone and called the police. But like with most stories like this, they arrived too late. Having experienced this myself, I can tell you that this outcome does make sense. My assailant failed to capture or kill me, so I don't think that they would stick around for the police to show up. The officers took my statement and did a thorough search of the area. They also had a squad car patrolling through the neighborhood for the rest of that night. I didn't tell my parents or my grandmother what happened until the next day. I figured that there was no need to worry them that night. I consider myself to be a pretty level-headed person, and that's mainly why I chose to share my story. Situations like this are terrifying, but you have to try to keep your wits about you. If I had lost my composure in that maze, I'm pretty sure that pickaxe would have found its way into my skull.